Okay, good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to offer a particular welcome to our new fellows and college members who were, present, who were inducted into the Academy of Science and the College of the Royal Society of Canada. Uh, J'aimerais tout d'abord remercier l'Université de Victoria, qui est le parent principal de l'Assemblée la, uh, générale annuelle, ainsi que Canadian Science Publishing, qui parrain ce café, ce café innovant. This innovation cafe will feature nine uh, presentations by our new fellows and college members, representing all four divisions of the Academy of Science. Uh, each talk, so this is very interesting, each talk will be accompanied by a presentation of 20 slides, and if you're not careful, the slides will automatically advance by itself, so you only have 20 seconds per slide. <laughs> and you have a total time of six minutes and 40 seconds. <laughs> uh, we would, like to, we would like to ask that you keep your questions until a period of open discussion after the series of talks. Throughout the afternoon, we encourage you to share the conversation on social media, we're very modern as you know, uh, by encouraging you to use the hashtag um, dagger AG AGM. Before we hear from our new fellows, I would like to invite Jules Blais, founding senior editor of Facets, produced by Canadian Science Publishing and sponsor of the Innovation Cafe to kick off today's presentation. Jules? Well, thank you very much. It is my pleasure to introduce FACETS, Canada's new multidisciplinary open access science journal published by Canadian Science Publishing, as you know, uh, formerly NRC Research Press, a non-profit publisher. It's widely recognized that in order to face the challenges of the 21st century, be it energy, environment, water, health, technology, a cross-disciplinary perspective will, will be needed. We are also witnessing a massive change in the way science is communicated. Open access is a new concept. Online journals have only been around for less than 15 years. Before this time, research was printed on paper and hand-delivered to libraries. Research was an exclusive enterprise. There, there has been a seismic shift in the research landscape in the last few years with open access becoming more prevalent. Open access permits public access to research, much of which is funded by you, the taxpayer. Open access can also serve to expand the reach, influence, and openness of research. We now li live in the age of the internet, and open communication will be for forever with us. This provides opportunities, but it also provides challenges. The internet has transformed the way we live, but it has also made the world a very noisy place. Thanks to the internet, we are all publishers now. Online communication has connected the world but raised the noise and reduced the quality of information we see and hear. The future of research communication will therefore depend on a responsible transition to openly accessible scientific research through rigorous review and a name that people trust. For any who still question whether open access may be a passing fad, consider that 25% of Canadian research is now published in open access, and 40% of Canadian researchers are using open access more now than in the recent past. And importantly, this year the Tri-Council Open Access Policy was introduced requiring all research to be published in open access. And this brings us to facets. We are the first multidisciplinary interdisciplinary open access science journal in Canada that will en encompass the STEM subject areas, which stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. FACETS is the Canadian open access option. Uh, FACETS became open for submissions in October 2015, and this is something to celebrate. The response from the community has been overwhelmingly positive. From prospective authors to librarians to a wider community of citizens interested in science, people are excited that Canada finally has its own open access multidisciplinary science journal. As our name indicates, our journal represents the multifaceted nature of research in Canada and beyond. To that effect, we accept a wide variety of paper types that represent the full coverage of research output with a focus on sound science that advances knowledge. We're committed to bettering the output of open access content and content in facets will be rigorously reviewed. Our research areas are the biomedical and health sciences, biological and life sciences, earth and environmental sciences, physical sciences, engineering technology and mathematics, and the integrative sciences, which will encompass topics such as science communication, science and policy, science education, science and society, science and ethics, and public health. 
This large scope of facets will be possible thanks to a stellar editorial board already consisting of almost 80 subject editors from nine countries. We have a global editorial board with a high standard of accomplishments. We have several mi mid-career scientists and rising stars. We also have officers of the Order of Canada, fellows of the Royal Society of Canada, who will bring a lot of experience and good judgment to our review process. Although most members of our editorial board are from Canada, we have representation in the USA, France, Germany, Brazil, China, Serbia, India, and New Zealand. So we are truly global in our reach. And it's been a delight to see who has actually come forward to, to serve on this, on this editorial board. Our promise is to provide a trusted open access publishing channel, to continue to champion a rigorous review process, to maintain our Canadian tradition for high quality publishing that is recognized internationally, and to participate in the conversation, watching and adapting as necessary. If you pub why publish with, tif with facets? If you publish sound research that advances our knowledge, we'd be happy to have you. Here are just a few reasons to publish your next paper with facets. Your research will travel. Facets is an international journal that showcases Canadian and international research in English and or French to a global audience. Your research, your choice, facets, multidisciplinary nature, and broad range of article types allows you to choose how you communicate your research. There are so many journals out there. Why do we need a new journal and what makes us different? Today, authors have so many choices in publishing outlet, many are indistinguishable from each other. We also have the threat of deceptive publishers who are watering down the quality of open access content and making it difficult for authors to choose a reputable publishing outlet for their research. We have done much to set ourselves apart from the other journals in our category, catering especially to the advancement of Canadian science. We will be multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, encouraging submissions that cross the traditional disciplines in science and engineering. We will be bilingual, accepting submissions in English and French, and we will be rigorous with the help of a stellar editorial board already recruited. Importantly, we are Canadian. I'm often asked, why do we need a Canadian open access science option? Canada is a vast country with its own issues and its own perspectives. We could ask the same about why we should preserve the CBC. Canadian scientists need a strong venue for publishing on our own issues under our own regulatory framework. We have our own Canada Health Act, our own Fisheries Act, our own Species at Risk Act, which have broad implications for the science we do in Canada. Uh, uh, we are all in this together. We have a vested interest in the future of publishing in this country and internationally. We additionally have a responsibility to shape the outcome of open access publishing in Canada and to make sure that op Canadian open access publishing is synonymous with, con with quality. FACETS is based on three pillars, community, choice, and quality. FACETS values community and was devel developed through consultations with scholarly stakeholders. FACETS provides choice by publishing a broad range of article types which results in a greater diversity of published research and ultimately improved dissemination of critical research. The success of open access requires collaboration from stakeholders across the entire scholarly communication landscape. At FACETS, we are keen to develop partnerships with distinguished organizations such as the RSC. As new fellows to the RSC, I'd like to reiterate the potential of forging a partnership between your society and Canada's open access journal. I'm specifically interested in working more closely with you. And with that, we invite, invite you to join the conversation. We want to hear from you. We want to connect with you. We are active on social media, and we have a, new, a newsletter which will promote new uh, open access articles. Um, uh, so please spread the news with your colleagues, departments, and students. Thank you very much. Okay, merci beaucoup, Dr. Bless, for sharing your presentation with us. Uh, you've just had a very good um, exhibition of speed talking and speed listening. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm pleased to introduce our second speaker, uh, Professor Alyssa Antle from the School of Interactive Art and Technology at Simon Fraser University. Alyssa Antle pushes the boundaries of computation to augment... Sorry? This... Uh, ah, sorry. The script I was emailed is a little bit different from the script. <laughs> I'm supposed to follow. Okay. <laughs> and I spent a lot of time practicing the script I was emailed. <laughs> okay, I'm pleased to introduce our second speaker. Robert Brandon Berger from the Department of Physics at McGill University. Professor Brandon Berger, a Canada researcher in theoretical cosmology, is largely responsible for the development of the theory of inflationary reheating. 
le professeur Brandenburger a fait d'importantes contributions à la cosmologie de début de l'univers. He is also well known for his pioneering work in the field of superstring cosmology, which can explain the earliest moments of the universe. Dr. Brandenburger's presentation is titled, What Was Before the Big Bang? Dr. Brandenburger? You're a super string. So first of all, thank you for giving me the chance to speak. I'm a theoretical cosmologist, and one of my interests is to study whether superstring theory can tell us something about the Big Bang. Cosmology is a wonderful field. Our instruments are located at beautiful places on the surface of the Earth, such as this optical telescope, which is high in the Trillian Andes. With these telescopes, we observe the sky, and we observe objects, galaxies, These are massive assemblies of stars, dust, and dark matter. But for us cosmologists, these galaxies which you see here are too small. We replace them by a point and look beyond. We look at the entire sky and study the distribution of galaxies. So very soon, you will see a projection of the entire sky onto a plane. Each point is a galaxy. There are regions of more galaxies, regions of less galaxies. Where does this structure come from? There are other observational windows to probe the universe. One of them is the microwave window. We have microwave telescopes which are located again at exotic places, such as in the Trillian Andes, the South Pole, or even in outer space, such as this WMAP satellite. With these telescopes, we measure the intensity or temperature of the cosmic microwave background which is impinging on us from all directions in the sky. We construct temperature maps, different colors, different colors indicate different temperatures. And as you see, there's a completely isotropic temperature distribution. Why is this so? Now, if we observe much more accurately at a sensitivity of better than one part in 10,000, then small temperature differences appear. And here you see the results from the WMAP satellite. Where does this structure come from? Now, as scientists, we must quantify the data. So we stick this beautiful map into a statistics black box, and out we get a boring curve. In this boring curve, the horizontal axis is angle in the sky, and the vertical axis is power, power of anisotropies. And here you see there's lots of structure, and we would like to understand where this structure comes from. So I hope to have shown you that in cosmology we have lots of data and mysteries which cry out for an explanation. Now the framework to prov that provides an explanation <coughs> is Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is 100 years old as of this month. According to Einstein, mass curves space, as you see in this picture. Now if mass is uniformly distributed, then space will expand like a raisin bread which you stick into an oven. And then you get standard Big Bang cosmology. So we are here looking backwards in time. And according to Einstein, the universe starts with a singularity, infinite temperature. Whoever has measured infinite temperature? Well, a big success of standard Big Bang cosmology is the prediction of a cosmic microwave background which has a black body nature. And here you see fre frequency, intensity, error bars are smaller than the width of a curve, a perfect black body. So, however, standard Big Bang cosmology cannot explain the fact that in different directions, different directions, the temperature is exactly the same because the points which we see are outside of causal contact, at least in standard Big Bang cosmology. But particle physics seems to come to the rescue. In 1980, particle physicists invented the idea of inflation, a period in the very early universe where space expands exponentially. Space expands expo exponentially, that means the horizon will expand exponentially, and this will allow us to provide causal contact between points which before inflation were not in causal contact. 
the horizon expands exponentially time and space. But inflation also provides a mechanism for forming structure. This is the scale that we see, the wavelength. The wavelength starts out very small, and we can come up with a causal structure formation scenario. But a problem. The wavelength, which our structure starts out with, is smaller than the Planck length. And we don't understand physics <coughs> on these wavelengths. This is a region where quantum gravity is important. And quantum gravity, a candidate for quantum gravity, is superstring theory. Now, if you take your box of superstrings instead of a box of particles, something very interesting happens. You compress the box of superstrings, but the temperature doesn't exceed a limiting temperature, as you see here. So in string cosmology, there's a chance that there is no singularity. Strings can do other things. For example, you can take space. They can wrap space and prevent space from expanding. Now, as Kuhn Waffer, a Harvard string theorist and myself, uh, argued a long time ago, this mechanism explains why only three of the nine spatial dimensions of superstring theory ever can become large. We developed an alternative to inflation called string gas cosmology for the theory of the early universe. According to this theory, if we go back in time, we end up in a static gas of hot strings. So the static gas of hot strings has thermal fluctuations thermal fluctuations of strings, time and space, and these thermal fluctuations develop, they propagate, and evolve into something which we can measure today. And as we discovered, what we measure, what is predicted by string gas cosmology is exactly what is seen. But we need to make predictions with which string gas cosmology can be distinguished from inflation. And here is where gravitational waves enter. Gravitational waves predict polarization of the microwave background, and inflation predicts po polarization which was below the curve, and string gas cosmology predicts uh, fluctuations which were above the curve. So right now, the error bars are too large, but in the future, we'll be able to tell. And so I'm going to leave you with these conclusions. String theory might lead us to a theory of the early universe without a big bang, observations will be able to tell. Thank you. OK, so thank you, Professor Brandenberger. Our next speaker is uh, Christine Chambers from the Department of Pediatrics and Psychology and Neuroscience at Dalhousie University. Uh, Christine is an internationally recognized researcher and clinician who has made important contributions to the understanding and treatment of pain in children. Her award-winning research has provided new tools for assessing pain and significant new approaches to managing children's pain. She's a tireless advocate who uses social media and other means to provide parents and health professionals the information needed to ensure optimal pain care for children. Dr. Chambers' presentation is titled The this thing? Hashtag. 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 <laughs> I was going to say the thing you read when you don't want to say the word in the <laughs> comics. <laughs> it doesn't have to hurt initiative, a social media partnership to address the problem of poorly managed pain in children. Professor Chambers. This is Elijah. He was born three months early, weighing just one pound, eight ounces. He spent the first four months of his life in the neonatal intensive care unit, where he experienced 858 painful medical procedures and surgeries in just the first six weeks of his life. Now, if Elijah had been born 30 years ago, he would have undergone all these procedures and surgeries with no pain management or anesthesia whatsoever. That's right, even as the late 1970s and 80s, it was widely believed that babies, especially premature babies, didn't feel pain. Fortunately, pain management in the NICU has improved dramatically for babies like Elijah. This is partly because considerable animal and human research has shown that poorly managed pain early in life does have negative long-term effects on the brain and the body. How did things change? 
A landmark paper was published in 1987 comparing a group of babies who received proper pain management to those who did not. It was the babies who received inadequate anesthesia who had more complications and were more likely to die than those pain who was managed properly. Around the same time, a brave mother, Jill Lawson, went public with her son's story of inadequate pain care in a high-profile piece in the Washington Post. Surgery without anesthesia? There was a major public outcry. How could this happen? Every mother knows that babies feel pain. I'm a child psychologist and pain scientist. For 20 years, I've been studying children's pain. While we've made major improvements in some areas, there are still many ways we are failing children when it comes to pain, such as pain from procedures like vaccination. Part of the problem is that health professionals don't get much training in pain. Veterinarians receive five times the training about pain during their education than human doctors do. That's right, your dog could get better pain care than you or your child. My four children have taken me to the front lines of pain management as a parent. There have been times that even I and my husband, an anesthesiologist, have had a hard time advocating for proper pain care for our children. If we have trouble, where does that leave every other parent? In pain and in many other areas, there is a 17-year gap between when research discoveries are made and when the findings are put into practice. I want to make sure that research gets directly and quickly into the hands of parents who need it. How to do that? Well, many parents are turning to social media like Facebook and YouTube for parenting advice and support. Social media use has grown tenfold over the last decade and is especially popular among parents. However, the information that parents often find online is not usually evidence-based. So I created a fun two-minute YouTube video for parents called It Doesn't Have to Hurt. In the video, a cute four-year-old girl teaches parents things they should and shouldn't do to help make painful procedures hurt less. All the tips are based on research. In the two years since its release, the video has been viewed more than 175,000 times in 150 different countries. The video has improved parent awareness about how to manage children's pain from procedures. But it was challenging for me as a researcher to reach all the parents that I wanted to. I learned if you build it, they do not necessarily come. After emailing the video to everyone I knew, I took to Twitter to spread my message. I reached out to influencers like Andre Picard from the Globe and Mail and Erica M from the yummymummyclub.ca, an online forum for mothers that reaches over five million people a month. I learned that when influencers like Andre and Erica shared my it doesn't have to hurt message and video, we had a huge jump in the number of views. This is a blog post that appeared on Erica's YMC about our video that drew a ton of views and greatly enhanced our dissemination efforts. This gave me an idea. What if I formally partnered with an online forum like Erica's YMC to share even more evidence-based information about child pain with parents? Eric and I met in person and we put together a proposal for a Knowledge to Action grant from CIHR to do just this. So in September of this year, we launched the It Doesn't Have to Hurt social media initiative. The research team provides evidence summaries on various topics in children's pain, and the YMC team yummies it up. They turn it into fun and interesting content and then push it out online using their established reach. It's been amazing to see our pain evidence magically turned into blog posts, social media images, Facebook polls, Twitter chats, and videos. Importantly, all our pain content and science is positioned in a place where parents are already going. We've had tremendous support for this work from various other partners. We held a launch event for the grant in Halifax in September, where we had an in-person and online discussion about the role of social media in health. 
The event tweeting about it doesn't have to hurt was the top three trending hashtag in Canada that evening. We are, of course, comprehensively evaluating not only the reach, but also the impact of the initiative and partnership. Can providing health research evidence this way to parents actually change practices and reduce child pain? We hope so. And if so, we think this model could be used to mobilize evidence in other areas. We want to improve child health outcomes for babies like Elijah, who I introduced you to at the beginning of my talk, shown here today on the left with his twin brother. To do so, we need to explore new models for health and science knowledge translation, just like it doesn't have to hurt. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Chambers. <laughs> They're well cued. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, our next speaker is Karen Hinzer from the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Ottawa. Karen is an associate professor at the University of Ottawa and the Canada Research Chair in Photonic Nanostructures and Integrated Devices. Her research involves developing new ways to harness the sun's energy. She has made pioneering contributions to the experimental physics of quantum dots, marked by two landmark papers in science. She's the founder of the Sun Lab, the premier Canadian laboratory for next generation solar devices and systems. Dr. Hinzer will talk to us today about solar energy. Dr. Hinzer. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Jamal. Merci beaucoup uh, à la Société royale du Canada pour m'avoir aujourd'hui. Is there a laser pointer? There is? Here? On there? OK, perfect. I see it. Um, je parle en français, ensuite je change à l'anglais. Je vais commencer par parler euh, du Sun Lab à l'Université d'Ottawa. C'est un groupe de chercheurs. Euh, on est environ 25. On fait partie du centre de recherche en photonique. Ici, voici, euh, on a des, même des jeunes chercheurs. On a des chercheurs entre... Euh, euh, du secondaire jusque dans la soixantaine. Le but de la recherche, euh, la photonique, c'est le contrôle de la lumière, la création de la lumière, la détection de la lumière. J'utilise la, la source de lumière qu'on a le plus naturellement, c'est notre soleil. Et puis, je, le groupe regarde à comment euh, convertir l'énergie lumineuse en électricité le plus efficacement possible. Ici, voici une carte d'une map monde indiquant les intensités moyennes par année pour différents endroits sur la Terre. Plus que la couleur est foncée, plus que d'illumination. Habituellement, il y a environ six heures par jour euh, pour euh, chaque emplacement sur la Terre. On peut voir que même à Victoria, il y a quand même beaucoup de soleil et il y a beaucoup de panneaux de solaire ici. Les panneaux sont utilisés, si vous regardez, c'est pour le stationnement, des utilisations très faciles, donc avec l'intégration facile. Ils utilisent le silicium, donc c'est les mêmes sortes de puces qu'on a dans nos téléphones, dans nos portables et euh, dans, euh, dans nos ordinateurs. L'efficacité est environ de 10 à 20 dans les systèmes. Si on compare avec une centrale au gaz ou au charbon, l'efficacité de transformation de l'énergie chimique à l'électricité est environ de 40 okay? Ça, c'est difficile à améliorer. Il y a des, il y a des, il y a des pertes au, le long du processus. Les cellules solaires pourraient aller beaucoup plus haut. Théoriquement, elles peuvent aller jusqu'à 85 de transformation d'énergie. Donc, si je regarde ici, je monte ma colline, les panneaux silicium sont, on est encore au corps, au bas, au bas de la colline. Donc, le but de, de, de notre recherche, c'est vraiment de se rendre jusqu'au bout où l'efficacité de 75 à 80 dans, ça pourrait être même jusque dans un système. Pourquoi est-ce que les panneaux silicium ne sont, sont, sont pas rendus là? C'est parce qu'ils prennent juste une partie euh, de la lumière, de, du soleil, du spectre solaire, et aussi une, une grosse partie se fait transformer en, en chaleur. J'attends la prochaine tranche. I'm, I'm not reading, so. <rire> um, Qu'est-ce qu'on doit faire si on doit utiliser tout le spectre solaire, euh, donc de l'ultraviolet à l'infrarouge proche? Et on doit, les, la, la, cellule, la cellule doit avoir différentes couches qui absorbent les différentes parties euh, de la cellule. Les couches sont très minces. L'épaisseur totale de la cellule est environ 10 microns, euh, qui est un dixième de l'épaisseur d'un cheveu. Avec les cellules multicouches, on peut maintenant se rendre à environ 40 d'efficacité. Donc, on est rendu au milieu de la colline. 
pour se rendre jusqu'ici, il faut continuer à ajouter les couches et aussi, il faut faire des systèmes plus efficaces. Je vais montrer ici quelques photos sur qu'est-ce qu'on fait dans notre recherche. Les cellules sont petites. Pourquoi? Pour, parce que les matériaux semi-conducteurs ne sont pas euh, les recyclés et la, la quantité d'énergie qui est requise euh, pour les construire est beaucoup plus grande que la vitre, les plastiques, les métaux. Donc, on utilise une petite quantité et aussi, euh, on les met, comme je disais, en couche. Habituellement, les épaisseurs, euh, les, les différentes épaisseurs ont, sont, ont différents matériaux. C'est tout euh, l'art, la recherche, c'est tout l'art de, de, de mettre les matériaux ensemble pour avoir une efficacité très élevée. Puis aussi, on regarde à la performance en, en fonction de l'environnement. D'ailleurs, au Canada, je, je pense qu'on va peut-être en publier quelque chose, on aurait publié quelque chose en facets. Euh, plus qu'on est au nord, euh, ce n'est pas les mêmes sortes de cellules qu'on doit utiliser euh, juste dans le restant du monde. Nous travaillons aussi à euh, changer le matériau de base qui tient euh, les, la structure. So here, the substrate is actually usually one of the largest costs of the system. Um, so we're working on reducing that. Here is an early uh, example. This is this one's at the National Research Council, and it shows that we're using a. This had a 27% efficiency in systems. It's still running. It's been running for over five years there, and. Uh, The, the cell is only a very small part, the rest is all recyclable. We are now doing research on systems, this is also commercialized by, uh, by a Canadian company, this is the founder, Richard Beal, where um, the uniformity of the light that hits the cell is much higher, and the cost of the system uh, is decreased by at least a factor of four. Um, what you can see here is that these systems work um, in all temperatures. We, we do a lot of optical design. So a system involves, is very multidisciplinary, and we work a lot on having a uniform illumination on all the different parts of the cell. Even though it's only 10 microns thick, um, with dispersion and other effects, um, you have to work very hard on having a uniform illumination as a function of the spectrum. We now work also with a company uh, from Toronto that makes these concentrating systems, but that are flat. So that, um, that the material is, is almost all recyclable. Actually, everything's recyclable. It's, fl uh, it's flat and uh, has over 30% efficiency. But what happens when the sun isn't shining? So we, uh, we've developed now, we're looking at how to integrate these systems um, into intermittent, uh, so that their intermi intermittency is not a drag. So right now the systems are really done for high illumination, for high illumination areas where there's not a lot of clouds. But what do, what do we do for, for all of Canada? So we have a new, a new test site that's called, uh, that's a, nano, a nanogrid, a smart nanogrid, on our new advanced research complex at the University of Ottawa. In this case, we're integrating smart chips with local manufacturers, uh, smart controls, and storage from, with Canadian, we're working with some Canadian co companies on storage. And um, trying to then make sure that um, renewables energy can be integrated in uh, the grid so that we have, um, um, nous avons toujours l'énergie euh, renouvelable disponible en tout temps. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. This is harder than I thought. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Professor Hinzer. Uh, we will now take a 10-minute break to enjoy uh, our lunch before continuing with our... Uh, I'm, I'm, reading, I'm reading exactly as it's written here. <laughs> before continuing with our second series of speakers. <laughs> Okay, so we continue the presentations. Our next speaker is Mark Lewis from the Department of Mathematical and Statistical Sciences and Biological Sciences at the University of Alberta. A Canada Research Chair in Mathematical Biology, Professor Lewis is a world leader in mathematical ecology. Il a apporté des contributions fondamentales à la science des mathématiques appliquées et à la résolution de questions sur le système dynamique non linéaire appliqué au problème écologique. His work has provided significant new insights regarding environmental questions, including biological invasions, wildlife disease, animal movement patterns, and effects of climate change. Dr. Lewis will present on the topic, seeing the environment through a mathematical lens. Dr. Lewis.
Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to talk today. Uh, can you see the uh, mathematics in this picture here? You have to look really closely. <laughs> and uh, you have to be able to see the seeds in, in, in the dandelion. Uh, there's uh, mathematics all around us in biology, but we have to look at things the right way to see the mathematics. And uh, it's in biology, and in particular, it's in the environment. And this is where I'm very interested. This might look, is this like your front lawn? It looks like my front lawn. <laughs> this is an invader. This was introduced by uh, European settlers. And um, uh, invaders cost uh, over 100 billion, that's with a B, dollars per year in North America. We'd like to find ways to control them. Uh, we can use mathematical theories to do this. If we know the life cycle of the invader, we can uh, come up with uh, mathematical methods to get a magic number called R0. If R0 is bigger than 1, the invader will succeed. If it's less than 1, it'll die out. We need to find ways to drive it to less than 1. This is mountain pine beetle, uh, very common in BC. It's spread over the mountains into Alberta, and we're trying to find ways to control mountain pine beetle. It's jumped hosts, and now it is in a different kind of pine tree, and we need to find ways uh, to uh, slow down the spread. Uh, the red areas are uh, new outbreaks, and the black are older outbreaks. We can take the topography, climate, pine tree levels, and the previous history of outbreaks, put this in a mathematical model, and predict where it's going to go next when we put it on the computer. Uh, we do this at a very fine level, at approximately one kilometer squared, and then we can predict where the outbreaks will go. And then when we look back historically, we can see how good a job we would have done. And we get it right about 85% of the time. And so we're working with the Canadian government, the Alberta government, stakeholders, industry, to try to find ways to uh, stem the spread with these kinds of models. We can also uh, use these kinds of models to look at non-invasive species, such as trees spreading with respect to climate change. And so as these temperature isoclines move north, we'd like to understand how the process of growth and dispersal allow them to keep up. Here, seed dispersal is a key element. My Field work gives me an opportunity to go to some very beautiful places. This is the Broughton Archipelago, and it's in the coastal mountains where these long fjords go out to the sea. They're teeming with life. Uh, salmon, orcas, um, uh, porpoises, not to mention grizzly bears and wolves on the shore. And it's also home to uh, salmon farms, which are shown with the red dots here. And uh, salmon exports are the uh, second largest agricultural export from BC and the largest legal agricultural export <laughs> from BC. <laughs> and there's been concern historically that uh, these salmon farms might be affecting the disease dynamics in wild salmon. In particular, a parasite called sea lice could be transferred back and forth between wild and farm salmon. So I work with my graduate students on these beautiful long inlets uh, with a beach seine net uh, catching the fish and um, sampling them to see if we can find an uh, impact of uh, a farm. As the fish um, go by the farm, can we see a change in the infection levels before and after they're exposed to this? It's me on the left and my graduate student, Stephanie Peacock, just graduated, pulling in the net. That can be cold work. Um, but if we're lucky, we get these uh, smalls of uh, schools of very small out-migrating uh, salmon. And this is a highly infected fish. Um, and so what we see is that uh, there is a lot of evidence showing that there is this cross-infection between farm and wild. The wild fish infect the farms, but then they return the infection when the fish are at a small, vulnerable stage. Not everyone has agreed with our work, but it's withstood the test of time. And uh, it's also changed some attitudes or, um, and, and also policies. And recently we've been working with industry and environmental groups to uh, try to move forward on the issue of disease management in aquaculture. This is a long-term project, and uh, we hope to do it for many more years. I'm very lucky to work with very many gifted biologists. Andy DeRoche, a polar bear biologist at the University of Alberta, took this picture. This bear has been feeding on the ice, eating seals. It's in good shape. And of course, there's a question. As climate change changes the ice dynamics, how will the reproductive success of the bears change? This is my graduate student, Jody Reimer, um, with a land fast bear. The bear has come off the ice and it's not eating, it's fasting until it can go back when the ice forms. 
as the climate changes, there's less time on the ice and more on the land, and we're interested in the reproductive success. This is how a mathematician would see a bear uh, energy budget. We put together an energy budget for polar bears. This was a breakthrough because previously energy budgets had been for things like zooplankton. And we kind of upsized everything. And we could use the math to predict the reproductive success of bears, test it against data, and they make projections into the future. I see patterns everywhere. These are patterns of territories from coyotes in Washington State. And each color shows a different uh, space use from a di different territory. I think of pattern formation as a mathematical question. How do you take rules for individuals, put them together, and then see how they can predict outcomes that will emerge spontaneously like patterns of territories? This is what we did here. This is, was originally a theoretical model. The purple areas are where scent marks are, and these three surfaces show the space use. But we can also fit this to the real data and uh, get a map uh, now back on the, uh, on, the, on the coyotes and see how the space use is being affected by behavioral interactions. People have used these models for Amazonian birds, for South African meerkats, and even have modified a version to look at gang territories in LA County. We're hoping to uh, use this for uh, panda bear home ranges. If we modify our environment, uh, we're affecting it uh, and then we change the dynamic balances. Here, linear features in Alberta affect the uh, predatory efficiency of wolves and change the balance. With mathematics, we can gain new insight and we can become better stewards uh, environmentally. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lewis. Uh, our next speaker is Mutu. Bakirisami from the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering at Concordia University. Mutu is a research chair on optical bio microsystem and a leading scholar in the field of biomedical microelectromechanical systems or biomems. Dr. Pa Pakirisami's work merges MEMS technology, the fabrication and integration of mechanical elements, sensors, actuators, and electronics on silicon microchips with cutting edge biological and life sciences research to develop innovative approaches to diagnostics, laboratory analyses, drug delivery, and healthcare. Dr. Pakirisami's presentation is titled Microbridging of Biology and Engineering. Please. Thank you, thank you Jamal Dean, and thank you for this opportunity, and good afternoon. Okay. Is, uh, as well as the Nobel laureate Philip Shaw, the third revolution life sciences which can tackle the problems in nervous system or cardiovascular system or cancer diagnosis, or taking these curves to clinic or personal education or training can happen only when we have the strong collaboration among engineers, biologists, and phys physical scientists. Because there exists a fundamental synergy at the scaling level across this discipline. For example, the recent fields like synthetic biology or genetic engineering are a good example that where the convergence of these fields happen. So there is a strong scope out of this, that revolution among them. And microbridging, I mean, is a bridging through micro nanotechnologies, which is one way of realizing the collaboration among these three disciplines. And I take this opportunity to thank my collaborators in biosciences, engineering, and physical sciences, without whom I can't show you this example that I'm going to show you today. For example, in case of scaling, in biological systems like protein to cells, they vary from nanometers to uh, millimeter level. If you look at the microengineering, we have fabrication and inspection facilities that also can capture these dimensions. Okay, this is fundamental synergy that happens at this level. And how am I exploring this for microbridging? I'm going to explore this developing lab on a chip technologies which capture from millimeter to nanometer microns or micro nano integration technology scattered from microns to nanometer. What's a lab on a chip? Lab on a chip is a technology in which you miniaturize many functionalities of the lab into a single chip. That's what we do in a lab on a chip. So that has huge potential. Like in this case, we lab on a chip with the channels and micro chambers in the same dimension as that of the cells, where cells can be nurtured with nutrients, carbon dioxide, oxygen, even heat, with conditions similar to the to that of in vivo conditions. So we are creating some sort of a cozy home for cells, like a macro home where we have good heating. And we can also 
trap the cells in ex vivo chips where we can culture them, diagnose them, manipulate them under this environment which is similar to the in vivo condition creating equivalent of electrical, chemical or mechanical cues which has long application in drug development and personalized medicines and cellular and molecular biology. In another case, when these bioelements interact with tiny microstructures, the cantilevers, they produce forces which deflect these cantilevers. The very pattern of the deflection itself the indication of many things, like can be used for diagnosis of cancer cells, different types of enzymes, antigens, proteins, or even chemicals. It has a huge applications from molecules to cellular. On the case of micro nano integrations, like here, we integrate the gold nanoparticles on the microfluidics can be used to capture antibodies, which can again can capture specific antigen or disease specific uh, pathogens can be used for diagnostic purpose or biosensing purposes. In the similar way, like we can also integrate the gold nanoparticles on the nanotube itself, which can be used to capture antibodies and specific antigens, which could be later collected for disease diagnosis or biosensing. We use this antigen antibody platform for detecting growth hormones in milk. We know that for example, here, the growth hormones are usually injected into the cow for various reasons, even though they're disbanded in Canada. But the present techniques to identify the very expansive, it takes weeks of time and thousands of dollars. So here we, we develop handle devices so that which is around 1,000 times cheaper than the existing technology and also can be used by the farmer at the farm itself. This is a miniaturized device which is the size of a, less than a quarter of a Canadian where we miniaturize the entire lab like spectrometers, a lot of test tubes, optical fibers all integrated into the same chip including the sample preparations. So a farmer can carry in his pocket and do the testing at the point of need applications on the farm itself. In the other application we know the solar energy is abundant but here we propose to generate indirect extraction of energy using the photosynthesis of blue-green algae here. When Plants and algae do photosynthesis in the day or respiration in the night. They release electrons as part of the food production cycles. If I can collect the electrons by making this algae swim in a micro lake surrounded by microelectrodes and circuitry, I can generate the electricity. So this is what we did here as the tiny chip, we can create around hundreds of microwatts of power with some few hundreds of photoalgae, uh, blue-green algae into this. Uh, chip, you can see the electrodes here. But how will you multiply? By stacking thousands of these photosynthetic chips, we can basically power devices like iPhones and computers. And uh, what is interesting thing is compared to photovoltaic, here we can generate electricity both in the daytime as well as in the night because the plants keep breathing both in the day as well as the night. So that's something advantages when compared to uh, photosynthesis here. Very interesting work on how the sperms are released in uh, pollen tubes. The pollen tubes pass through a different openings of different sizes, so the pollen tubes are skews. When they are skews, so they get pressurized and burst to open the pollen. Basically, the sperm cells are burst to open and, and from this bursting of the pollen tubes. It's similar to uh, like a cat here. In this behavior, what happens is the pollen tubes are <coughs> very carefully grown and hit on a micro cantilever, which is moved by the force exerted by these pollen tubes. Basically, the deflection is indication of health of these pollen tubes. Basically, can be used for sperm selection or drug de development or micro or cellular biology. Now, another example of minimally invasive surgery, like a endoscopic or laparoscopic surgery, we, we basically what we do is we develop a micro tactile sensor to, to give the feeling of the surgeons a feeling of touch so that is equivalent of extending his finger into the body so that he can feel what kind of parts he touches, which is, doesn't exist at present. So as a short, what we do is we can miniaturize the conventional lab into handle devices and lab on a chip, which is useful for point of care and point of need applications. As we have seen, we can apply it from molecular level to cellular level. It's like miniaturizing an elephant into a bee. So we can do a lot of functionalities into the bee level chips by miniaturizing this. What's the future? Basically, we can miniaturize the whole hospital into a chip, which could be given to your house. So a, a, a patient can have a hospital just next to him. That's the future that we can dream of this. What I want to say finally is the microbridging through uh, cellular as well as at the molecular level can essentially collaborate, uh, facilitate the collaboration across the three disciplines. And thank you for this opportunity.
Okay, so th thank you very much, Professor Pakirisami. Our next speaker is Merit Toretsky from the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of Guelph. Merit is internationally recognized for her work on the ecology and carbon cycling of northern ecosystems. Her pioneering studies on understanding the ecosystem and human health consequences of climate change have led to fundamental shifts in how we manage resources threatened by disturbances such as wildfires and permafrost thaw. Her research has contributed to theoretical predictions of ecosystem structure and function, but also applies to regulation of carbon in a global change world. Dr. Toretsky's presentation is titled Permafrost Nation. Dr. Toretsky. Thank you. So what defines Canada? Is it sport? Is it food? Or is it the landscape? And if so, what about the Canadian landscape is quintessential Canadian? Well, Canada is a northern country, um, but most of us do live in the south. You know, to many Americans, heading north means hitting Canada. But to many Canadians, heading north means getting away, wilderness, purity. The North is a quintessential part of Canadian geography, but it's also part of our social fiber. The North as habitat, exploration, and inspiration. One feature that is common to Northern ecosystems is permafrost. Permafrost underlies more than half of Canada, and this makes Canada a permafrost nation. But our permafrost has the potential to influence the entire globe. So Canada is also a global permafrost nation. So what is permafrost? It is frozen ground, rock, soil, sediment that remains frozen year round. It sits underneath a seasonally thawed active layer. And this actually makes permafrost rather cryptic from the surface. But permafrost can underlie forests, tundra, wetlands and lakes. We know from many temperature records around the world that permafrost at depth is warming in consistent ways with air temperature. Now across many regions in Canada, permafrost is just within a few degrees centigrade of thawing, so it's very sensitive to climate. But we know what's coming because it's already happening. Lots of permafrost is warming. And this creates a feedback between permafrost and the Earth's climate. Thawing organic matter in permafrost is exposed to more microbial activity, which produces greenhouse gases, which feeds back to the Earth's climate. Now, um, I just messed up. Many, um, many models are starting to account for this kind of carbon feedback, so I'm off by one slide. <laughs> um, so let me just say that this is a positive feedback, what the media often refers to as a runaway climate scenario. Um, and this links permafrost carbon to climate scenarios. Global carbon models are just starting to account for this kind of feedback between permafrost and the atmosphere, but there's a tremendous amount of variation from model to model in what they're projecting for future carbon loss. And we wanted to know why, what's causing this variation? Well, quite simply, most models don't agree on how much permafrost is out there today, let alone how that permafrost is actually expected to respond to future warming, even when we control these models with the same climate information. So we have a lot of work to do. Now, I'm interested in a very particular type of permafrost thaw, which happens when these very ice-rich lenses thaw and collapse. This leads to surface subsidence and lateral thaw called thermokarst, and no models are currently representing thermokarst today. This can cause forests to change into lakes very, very quickly. Um, we have been starting to map thermokarst across the entire circumpolar region to try to make predictions about where it's most likely to occur. This work is being used in carbon cycle assessments, but also by northern communities for land management. What we know is that thermokarst affects less than 20% of the global permafrost domain. Um, so it's a hot spot process, but these small regions store a tremendous amount of soil carbon and thus are hot spots for future emissions to the atmosphere. So we are a little bit concerned about these hot spot regions and their influence on the Earth's climate because these emissions include quite a bit of methane emissions. <laughs> 
Methane is produced by anaerobic microbial activity under saturated conditions. And it's a much stronger greenhouse gas than CO2. It's also highly flammable. What I want to argue over the next couple of minutes is that thermocarst is a really interesting scenario for bridging the apparent divide between the physical and social sciences. For example, some of our tools are being used not only in carbon cycling, but also for land planning in the north. And that's been a really interesting process. And this is because Thermokarst affects northern infrastructure, anything that's rigid on the landscape. This kind of buckling is common to many northern communities, and it gives me instant insight into what's happening to the ground underneath. Not only roads, but pipelines, railways, homes, all of these infrastructures are affected by thermocarst, and permafrost science then is really critical to northern engineering and building. This undetected ice lens at the parking lot of the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where I also conduct work, thawed almost overnight, wrecked havoc on one of their main parking areas. In coastal communities, slope failure and erosion is a big concern. Big chunks of land can literally fall into the ocean in very abrupt periods of time. This causes loss of land, but also we don't know much about the fate of this earth material for ocean food webs, for example. We saw dramatic loss of coastline in Shishmaref, Alaska in just under two hours. So while loss of sea ice is increasing wave action in these northern communities, the warming of onshore permafrost exacerbates this issue, and this leads to a positive cl climate feedback. Thaw slumps such as the Selawak River are affecting traditional fisheries through increased sedimentation. This man's traditional trap line in the Northwest Territories has become literally a waterbed of thawing permafrost and moss. But in other areas, traditional knowledge is actually aiding science, giving us new tools to detect change and new information on permafrost processes. So I want to close by saying that the North is part of Canada and part of the Canadian spirit. Thus, this spirit is underlain by permafrost. Permafrost links Canadians to each other and to the North, but it also links Canada to the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pro Professor Toretsky. Our final speaker is uh, Professor Frank Van Wegel, a professor in the Department of Chemistry at University of Victoria. His research focuses on materials chemistry, ses études synthétiques, et spectroscopique, sans centré sur les propriétés fondamentales des particules nanométriques. The impact of his research lies in new optical and magnetic nanomaterials that find application in photonic devices and in the diagnosis and treatment of tumors. Dr. Van Wegel's talk is titled Improving Health with Nanotechnology Based on Rare Earth. Professor Van Wegel. It's on. I like, I like to stand over there. So the rare earth comprised the elements of lanthanum to lutetium, um, sometimes yttrium and uh, scandium are included as well. This is a misnomer, they're not rare, they're not earth. A better name is actually the lanthanide, which means to lie hidden. That's from a chemistry point of view because they're very hard to separate from each other. And that's why people thought in the past that they were rare, but they're not rare at all. So this is 19 seconds. So I work at the nano... <laughs> I'm eating up some seconds here, but a nanometer scales to a meter as a small apple pit scales to the length of the province. And if you would do this on a ping pong ball, you get about three, th uh, three times the uh, size of the earth. So that gives you the length scale of things. So we make very different nanoparticles in our group, lanthanide based, the topic of today. We do semiconductors, so quantum dots with <laughs> optical properties, and we do me metallic particles, and they're all at the moment aimed at medical imaging, especially of cancer, and hopefully in the, in the near future therapy, and we have a small project on traumatic brain injury. <clears throat> so why bother at all, you may ask? Well, if a surgeon has to resect a tumor, he better know where it is, what the shape is. He wants to cut a little bit extra, but he doesn't want to make a hole in you. Uh, the same for radiation therapy. You have to know where the tumor is, what the shape is, because you want to localize the damaging radiation at the tumor and spare healthy tissue. 
So some basic requirements, it has to be stable in blood, which is a horrible mixture. So it's a, it's a challenge. You want a strong signal, because you want to in inject minimum amounts. It has to be specific, so in our case, tumors, typically done with antibodies and the like, have to be non-toxic, and they have to clear from the body. So this is a cartoon. So we have a core particle. I'm not sure whether... With dope with lanthanide ions, we have a shell to change the properties, and we have ligands on the surface functionalities. Uh, and as a chemist, I like to know where every ion is, basically. Every ion in the material, I want to know where it is. I want to know where every molecule on the surface is. I want to know where the functionalities are, etc. Because they all together give you the ultimate properties. Uh, in our lab, most of the time goes actually to the synthesis of the particles and the uh, post-modification and then some characterization. So what I like to know is what's here, what's in the core, what's in the shell, what's that interface. I created a new interface. How is the ligand coordinated to the interface? I want to know where A is and if it is reactive. And we try to answer all those um, uh, questions um, along, along the route. So I, I'm allowed to play with very expensive uh, equipment. One microscope we have at UVIC is $20 million. This is actually a cheap one. But what you do is you, you, you beam electrons through your specimen and all kinds of physical processes happen that attenuate the beam and you get an image. <coughs> and an image is actually on the next slide of sodium ethium fluoride. You see we have nice uniform particles. If you crank up the uh, resolution of the microscope, you see that the particles are actually single crystals. There are lots of things you can do in an electron microscope these days. This is another um, <coughs> uh, a technique that we use based on a scattering phenomena, where we see that the gadolinium is on the outside um, and the atrium is on the inside. EELS is another spectroscopic technique that you can use. And in this case, we scan the particle and we look for gadolinium. And you would say, well, that's a nice, that's a good particle because I have a shell around the whole core. And this is a not so good particle, which means we have to improve on the synthesis. The other thing we do is we go to the synchrotron in... Uh, in, uh, in Saskatoon, the Canadian light source, and in essence what you do there is you, you run around a beam of electrons and every time you have to bend the electrons, you have to conserve momentum and it sends out radiation from gamma rays to far infrared. And we use what they call soft X-rays to do a technique that's called XP XPS, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. It's element specific, it's oxidation specific, and the good thing about a synchrotron is that I can change the X-ray energy. And with that, I can change the kinetic energy of the photoelectron. And if you do this right, you get a nanometer profiling. And that's exactly what we need to study our nanoparticles. So this is a basic measurement where we show that there is yttrium and gadolinium in our core shell, the better B, because that's what we wanted to make. And this is a, a picture where we actually do this depth profiling, very, uh, very sensitive measurement, and we show that gadolinium is on the outside and yttrium is on the inside. You can do a lot more at a synchrotron because it's a very bright source, so you can throw away a lot of light. You still have a lot of intensity of a very monochromatic X-ray beam, and you can measure with very high resolution. And with that, you get very detailed information, as is shown on the next slide. 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 And there it is. Yttrium should have a doublet. If you have one type of yttrium in these particles, you should have one doublet here. If you deconvolute this nicely, you get two doublets. So we concluded from this that the bulk the bulk yttriums are slightly different from the surface yttriums. <coughs> That's a thing you can't easily get from other measurements, by the way. So in this case, we have sedated the mouse. We, sh we removed the hair. We shaved the skull. We went through the skull with nine um, 980 nanometer excitation, and we collected the emission from thallium at 800. This is false colored, but we get uh, a, res a resolution of the capillaries in the brain of a mouse. The other thing you can do with these particles, because they also have magnetic properties, not only optical, you can actually do uh, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. This is one where they put in humans. This is at higher field for small animals like mice and rats. And there is a contrast inherently, but you like to improve the contrast. And these are two um, animal models that we have done. This is a, a mouse that has a brain tumor, a human, very aggressive brain tumor, and you see Upon injection, you see a change in the contrast, and the same is true for breast cancer, also in a mouse model. <coughs> in a mouse model. 
So the foundation is there. There's a long way to go. I hope to be in a first clinical trial between five and ten years from now. I'd like to th thank my collaborators with whom I wouldn't stand here. The many collaborators I need to do uh, to make progress on this. And this is truly interdisciplinary research. And with that, I have talked for 19 seconds. Thank you very much. <laughs> So thank you very much, Professor Van Wegel. Uh, please join me in thanking all our speakers for their fascinating presentations. Uh, we would also like to thank once again the University of Victoria and Canadian Science Publishing for their generous support, which made this event possible. I hope you enjoyed this afternoon's program. It's now a quarter after one, according to the schedule. Actually, we're ahead of time. All right. Yeah. So I invite you to use our remaining time together, approximately 15 minutes or so, to engage with your peers in open discussions about the topics covered this afternoon. But I also want to make some other comments that are not in the script. <laughs> <laughs> so today you've had a really fascinating opportunity to learn things from length scales that are nanometers all the way to light years. I also learned something very interesting. If you speak to the screen three times, it listens to you. <laughs> So that's a good tip. <laughs> uh, I also learned about the fascinating work that um, the young researchers are doing and our um, established researchers from lab and chip technology to enhance uh, solar cells with very high efficiencies to pain management to Canada's permafrost. Really very, very fascinating work. I think we're living in very exciting times and we're very happy to be among a collection of really talented people. The future for science and engineering in Canada is in the good hands of all of you. Merci beaucoup. <laughs>